It's good to be with you and love to everybody out there. My website is jasonburnspreacher.com and you can also look at uh, my Facebook which is Bible teaching and Twitter which is more apologetic material. Uh, we've been looking at the doctrine of annihilationism. We've been considering how dangerous it is. We've been considering some of the main plank arguments that they produce and we've kind of rebutted them and then we've offered some passages that contradict what the annihilationist says and then we've shown some other issues concerning the problem with annihilationism um, concerning the seriousness of sin uh, which modern man doesn't want to consider and also the theological issue of the Christology of Jesus we've looked at these issues it's taken a long series we, we went into depth about Romans chapter 6 and we looked at that, we looked at two commentaries, one didn't back the traditional view, it didn't go against it, but the other commentary which was Matthew Poole uh, substantiated what our interpretation was. So we've looked at a, a whole ramification, we've looked at a lecture by Fudge, we've considered various debates that uh, Fudge and uh, another annihilationist we're involved in and we've looked at a PhD and some uh, comments from a PhD so you can be assured that there's been some in-depth scholarship uh, given in this video and I'm going to give you my final conclusions on this uh, topic and before I do I want to pray Dear Father, we come before you today and we confess our sin. We acknowledge our guilt and we acknowledge our sin and we acknowledge our weakness of our hearts. We acknowledge our pride and we acknowledge our lack of love. And we come before you today. We give you the prayers, we give you the glory and we give you the honour. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your love. And we thank you for your blessings. And we praise you and we worship you. And we honour you, Lord. And we pray, Father, in this conclusion. I just pray that you bless my final meditation and my final thoughts. And I pray that this video will be a blessing and a help to people and encouragement to people and a strength in their faith. In Jesus' name, Amen. Um, so I'm going to conclude again. If we go to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1 says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you, that would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. He said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, than that which you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if yet I please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not matter of man. Paul here warns of the apostasy of the gospel. He clearly states that people have departed from the gospel and to be cursed. Annihilationism is another gospel. Annihilationism, without people realising it, I don't think they intentionally mean this, but it undermines the deity of Christ and attacks the very nature of who Christ is. If men are annihilated, if Christ is dying for men, then he must have been annihilated. If he was annihilated, was it his human nature or God nature? If it was his human nature, then it means that the nature of the God-man was split. And that's heresy. If it was the God-man, God nature annihilated, then that means that God died. And God cannot die as in a literal annihilation. 
Chalcedon on teaching is that Jesus is the two natures in one, which means that when Christ died, his two natures were not separate, but they were two in one. That's orthodoxy, that's Chalcedon Christology. Annihilationism attacks that very doctrine to the very core. Annihilationists will say, well, we don't want to talk about this, it's a mystery, etc. But the reality is, it, there's a contradiction within their teaching, and it's to be abandoned and to be ignored as heresy. Secondly, um, you've got to be discerning. These teachers are very brilliant in their teaching, very crafty, very able to present arguments. And you have to be grounded in the Word of God. They even use conservative language. They will even use reformed or conservative scholars. They will quote Calvin, even John MacArthur or R.C. Sproul to prove their point. And they come across as very palatable. The church is very weak theologically and feels the pressure put upon it by the world that says, we don't believe your God is just for sending people to hell. And the church being weak and rather than God-centered, man-centered, listens to man and wants to please man and then produces preachers and teachers and theologians that give them and feed their itching ears. Itching ears so that they can make the gospel palatable and easy for people to accept. And so they let these theologians and pastors and preachers come along who will itch their ears and give them something much more easier than the doctrine of hell. But these are damnable heresies and serious, serious, serious heresies that undermine the gospel and undermine what Christ has done for sinners. That he died and took the wrath that they deserve, the eternal wrath, so that they could be saved. So it's important that you don't be sidetracked by these teachers or be seduced by these teachers who are very powerful in their debate skills and very powerful in their scholarship. You must be firm and strong in the Word of God and in good sound theology. That's why it's important to read great good Christian books like the Puritans and they will keep you strong in the faith. So that's the first one. The need to be discerning. Secondly, the need to stand for truth. If an annihilationist comes to you, you need to challenge them. Once you challenge them, if they don't want to listen and you try to explain to them, you need to ignore them. If they're a preacher or a teacher, they need to come off staff. They need to, if they're a theologian or a pastor, they need to be sacked and you need to get them out of the church. If they're an elder and they're preaching, they need to be coming off the eldership. They must not be allowed to teach this stuff in the churches, for if you do allow them, they will secularize the church. They will destroy orthodoxy from within, and you need to oppose it. It is a dangerous doctrine, and it will secularize the church if you allow it to infiltrate the church. So you must make a stand, no matter how orthodox they come across, no matter how nice they are, no matter how eloquent they are, and no matter how presentable their arguments are, it's a dangerous, damnable doctrine and must be opposed and you must stand up against it. Thirdly, doctrines are not produced in isolation. Whenever someone preaches a, a, a teaching, it's not in isolation of other doctrines. Whenever you're dealing with a heresy, you must ask yourself the question, how does this teaching impact other Bible passages? How does this teaching impact the whole of Scripture? How does this teaching affect the whole of theology, biblical theology and systematic theology? When you start to look at biblical theology and systematic theology and look at the doctrine of God, the doctrine of man, the doctrine of Christ, these heresies will be exposed. It's called the analogy of faith. Now the heretics and these annihilationists will tell you that they are using the analogy of faith. But they tell you that 
The analogy of faith is the whole Christian doctrines. They will tell you that they are using the analogy of faith, but they're not. You need to use the analogy of faith. You need to use the whole counsel of God, the whole of the doctrines that the Bible teaches. To look at the doctrine that they're teaching. And when you do that, you'll see the inconsistencies within their teaching. And we see that with the doctrine of Christ. That it undermines the deity of Christ. So use the wider systematic and biblical theology to hermeneutic and take on this doctrine and it will uh, you will undermine oops something fell there you'll undermine the teaching next hermeneutics these people will say that they're using the historical grammatical method they mean well but they're not telling you the truth they, they're not purposely hiding it but they're not using the historical grammatical method they will present tons of verses to you as if they're getting it in context. But actually, they just have a view that people are annihilated and they're using that view and then pushing it onto every Bible verse that you look at. So if you was to quote in Luke 16 about Lazarus, they will take that hermeneutic that Bible teaches annihilationism, that men were annihilated and they will look at uh, Luke 16 and just try to explain it away that it's not teaching about hell in any way shape or form about Lazarus uh, about the guy talking to to Abraham etc in in hell so the, the hermeneutic is not the historical grammatical method they will tell you that it is they will tell you they're being biblical but the reality is they have a philosophical view that men are not annihilated and that philosophical view they push it onto scripture and they don't allow scripture to speak in its context they don't see the old testament as part of progressive revelation they read into the old testament a chronology that is not within each text the text does not share in the old testament there is a chronology of death and uh, uh, death uh, resurrection uh, judgment and annihilation that chronology is not in the old testament so the hermeneutic they're imposing upon the text not allowing the text to be in proportion to what it to what it is now they will try to come across and say that they are so when they're looking at the book of revelation they will say a book of revelation is not literal and, and so they will try to come across as being uh, exegetes of in a historical grammatical method but the reality is and you have to realize this that ultimately the hermeneutics is pressured by culture. The culture says they do not believe in hell. And so the church is collapsing on that. Now your annihilationist scholars will categorically deny this. They will say that they are following the Bible. That they want to follow the Bible. But the reality is they cannot stand the doctrine of hell. And they'll try to explain it away no matter what. That is the reality. And you mustn't believe what they're saying. They might be sincere what they say, but deep down they hate the doctrine of hell and they want to get it out. And they'll say anything to you to make you think that they're just trying to be biblical. They're trying to be orthodox. They're trying to do an ology of faith. They're trying to be exegetical, historical grammatical method. The reality is they're not, being, they're not using the analogy of faith. Because if they did, they'd see the contradiction in what they're saying. They're not using the historical grammatical method. If they did, they'd let progressive revelation take its place. Rather than using the Old Testament over the New Testament, they would take the Old Testament in proportion as it grows into the full fruition of the New Testament. They are conscious about the fact that people out there don't like hell and they want to water it down to suit people's opinion. They don't understand that God takes sin seriously and we must take sin seriously i've studied this passage for the last few days i've looked at some of their scholars and i've grappled with the text and i don't say i've got it all sussed or all convinced in in every way but i'm absolutely sure that the bible teaches about hell i might not have every passage sorted or every argument sorted but i do think that hell is clear that there is a doctrine of hell 
But I'm not worried about the philosophical argument against the doctrine of hell. Because I believe that God is great. And I believe that hell is just telling us how serious and terrible it's going to be for those who reject God. That the wrath of God is, is, is terrible because sin is terrible. And God hates sin. And I believe that Christ had to be eternal. He had to be the Son of God to take the punishment for our eternal sin. And I believe that is logical and I believe that is biblical. He said, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then he says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us in John chapter 1 verse 14, which shows you that the Eternal became man. Why did the Eternal become man? Why wasn't he just a man? He had to be eternal. He had to suffer for us because he was, and die for us because he's the Eternal Son of God, because our sins had eternal significance. And I believe the traditional theology and, and the history of theology and the history of the church uh, has been right to hold to penal substitution and, and heaven and hell. And um, we, we need to hold on to the truth and, and to the word of God. So I hope that's been a blessing to you. Um, I hope it's encouraged you. I hope it's helped you. I hope it's given you some resources to think about uh, this teaching uh, and to arm you and to, uh, to forewarn you uh, against this heresy. It's a very pernicious, evil doctrine. It's very, very dangerous. If it gets in the church, it will secularize the church. It will destroy the deity of Christ and the church will be decimated by this kind of false teaching. And no amount of clever semantical arguments that these people can bring up can undermine the basic gospel message that Christ died for hell deserving sinners and he died to save us from eternal wrath and we get eternal life through Jesus Christ. But there is eternal wrath, eternal judgment and it's a terrible judgment. So, I hope that's been a blessing to you. And I hope it's given you through for thought. I hope it encourages you and, and strengthens you in your faith. If you want to read a book, I would suggest that uh, if you type in Master Seminary, uh, Hell, uh, there's a 128 page booklet there on the doctrine of hell and it goes into four or five essays and they're very very good also i would encourage you to read shed's endless punishment is, a, is another good book that will help you so i hope that what i've done has at least given you some food for thought i hope it, it has at least made you realize that uh, annihilationism is a very dangerous doctrine and uh, to, to have your defences up. You're going to need your defences up because this doctrine is very, very pernicious and there are some very eloquent teachers out there who if you listen to them and if you don't take on board what I've been saying, you'll be swept along with what they're saying because there's a church out there that is looking for this kind of teaching, wants this kind of teaching of annihilationism because they, they want to please men and they want to pacify their conscience. They're uneasy about the doctrine of hell. But why should we be uneasy about the doctrine of hell? God is God at the end of the day and this is what it comes down to. When Anthony Flew did not become a Christian but rejected God because he said he couldn't believe in hell, when Bertrand Russell said he couldn't believe in God because of the doctrine of hell. What they're saying is God cannot be God. Because if you strip everything down, if you strip everything down, there is a God. Atheism is not a viable option. There is a God. And, and if there is this God, you, we're going to meet this God. And God is an awesome God. And if he's an awesome God, he has a right to judge. If he has a right to judge, he has a right to send people to hell. 
So whichever way you look at it, you can't get out of it. You might not like the doctrine of hell, but you can't get rid of God. And God is not this wishy-washy, namby-pamby, politically correct, do-gooder, but God is a great, mighty God, a God of wrath and a God of love. And if he chooses to send people to a hell of eternal torment, whatever that may be, he has a right to do it. God is God. And that is the summing up of this whole debate. It's not whether, it's not just about the exegesis. It's about whether God has the right to be God. Men don't like the doctrine of hell because they don't like the God of Scripture. Okay, God bless you and love to everybody. I'm going to pray and ask the Lord's blessing. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. And Father, I just pray that this video would be a blessing to people, a help to people, an encouragement to people. And I pray, Lord, it will help them to defend the faith in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and for your glory, Lord. Amen. Amen. So if you look at um, Shedd's Doctrine of Endless Punishment, also go on Monogism and you'll see um, Al Martin's Ten Sermons on Hell. Al Martin's Ten Sermons on Hell are very, very help helpful. Um, and John Blanchard wrote a book called Whatever Happened to Hell. So John Blanchard, Whatever Happened to Hell, Sheds Endless Punishment. And then on top of that, I would encourage you to go and listen to Al Martin's sermons on the doctrine of hell. Hope this has been a help to you. Um, yeah, you can go to, uh, to look at the other opinion. You could look at Edward Fudge. Uh, website which is a well resourced website and I think uh, there's a website called Rethinking Hell and they have uh, lots of scholars that teach annihilationism um, so the other side you can look at Edward Fudge you can look at Rethinking Hell the website also, from an Orthodox perspective, if you go on Legionnaire Ministries, R.C. Sproul has done four videos on the Doctrine of Hell. You can also go and read uh, Jonathan Edwards' Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And just to say this, that which doctrine has been used of God in revival? Has the Doctrine of Annihilationism been used in revival? Or has the Doctrine of Hell of eternal torment been used in revival. Whitfield and Wesley did not teach annihilationism, they teach the doctrine of hell. They were used in revival. Jonathan Edwards was used in revival, he taught the doctrine of hell. Spurgeon was used in revival, he taught the doctrine of hell. Wherever there's been a revival, there's been a teaching of the doctrine of hell. Annihilationism has never been owned of God and never been used of God because it's rank heresy. All right. God bless you. Don't forget my website, jasonburnspreacher.com, and also uh, Facebook and Twitter. God bless you.